Thank you. So I'll begin uh, with introductions. I'm Akshaya Kumar. I'm the Deputy United Nations Director for Human Rights Watch. And alongside me, we have our Executive Director, Ken Roth, who will be presenting on the key conclusion of this report, which has to do with the widespread and systematic nature of what we've been able to document. Uh, and also, uh, my other colleague, our Deputy Director for the Middle East and North Africa, Lama Faki. Human Rights Watch has a long history of working on chemical weapons in Syria. M perhaps most dramatically, we were able to, within a month of the October attack on Eastern Ghouta, uh, come forward publicly with findings that the Syrian government was likely responsible for that attack. And since that attack, uh, the chemical weapons usage in Syria that has received the greatest news and media attention has been the early April attack in Khan Sheikhoun. And today's uh, press conference provides our research analysis and findings on that particular event, uh, as well as an attempt to contextualize that in the broader history and context of the ongoing use of chemical weapons in Syria. Some of you may have noticed over the weekends that the head of the OPCW mentioned that they have found 45 uh, instances of the use of chemical weapons in Syria since the middle of last year, 2016, until now which uh, fits into this broader pattern that we're speaking about. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ken. Thanks, Akshaya. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm here this morning to, to release Human Rights Watch's latest report, um, Death by Chemicals, which looks at the Syrian government's systematic use of chemical weapons in, in recent months. Um, as Akshaya mentioned, there's already considerable evidence put forward by the OPCW, Turkey, and France um, indicating that, that the Syrian government's April 4th aerial attack on Khan Sheikhoun involved um, sarin, a, a nerve agent. Human Rights Watch has done its own investigation, um, not only of the April 4th attack itself, but also of a pattern of attacks leading up to April 4th. And this pattern is important because it undermines the Russian and Syrian cover story for the attack. Recognizing that many people suffered symptoms of a nerve agent, Russia and Syria claim that a Syrian bomber in Khan Sheikhoun must have hit a rebel cache of either sarin or, or, or some kind of nerve agent or, or perhaps pesticide. Now, holes have already been poked in that theory because the timing was inaccurate. Um, the, the Russian and Syrian version says that the attack occurred several hours after people already began um, showing signs of, of, of having been exposed to a nerve agent. Today, um, Human Rights Watch introduces another set of facts from our own investigation, which renders the Syrian and Russian cover story utterly implausible. Now, it's widely known that Syrian forces have regularly used chlorine as a chemical weapon, and I will come back to that in a moment. What's not widely known is that in the months before the Khan Sheikhoun attack, Syrian agents also delivered nerve agents at least three separate times that we document. One instance was just days before, near Al Latamina on March 30th in northern Hama province, which is just about 15 kilometers southwest of Khan Sheikhoun, which itself is located in southern Idlib province. Now, that particular attack did not cause any deaths, but dozens were injured, including both civilians and combatants. In addition, evidence strongly suggests that Syrian forces dropped nerve agents twice in eastern um, Hama, near the towns of Dru and al Salalia on December 11th and December 12th, 2016 in an area controlled by ISIS. Now, it's harder for Human Rights Watch to communicate with people in this ISIS-controlled area because of the obvious security risks to them, but witnesses say that 64 people, at least, were killed in these attacks. It is simply preposterous to believe that in all four of these cases since mid-December, Syrian conventional bombs somehow just happened to hit caches of nerve agents or pesticides. Rather, 
the pattern shows that the Syrian government retained sarin or some similar nerve agent after its August 2013 Eastern Ghouta attack, despite having agreed to hand over all chemical weapons to UN inspectors. Now, Assad apologists have also asked why would the Syrian government risk using nerve agents when the war seemed to be going its way? But all four of these attacks were in areas where opposition or ISIS forces were launching an offensive that threatened government military air bases. Short on ground troops and already having gotten away with using chlorine as a chemical weapon, the Assad government decided to deploy the nerve agent. This pattern of the Syrian government using nerve agents makes the Syrian and Russian cover story preposterous. There is no way that on four different occasions, in four different places, Syrian bombers just happened to hit caches of nerve agents, even ignoring the fact that there is no evidence that such caches ever existed. It's time for Moscow and Damascus to stop these transparently false diversionary claims and to come clean about this grotesque breach of international law. Now, as for the Khan Sheikhoun attack itself, because of security concerns, Human Rights Watch was not able to visit the site itself, but we did conduct interviews with 60 people with firsthand knowledge. And we also reviewed photographs and videos. I'm gonna highlight a few things, and then um, my colleague, Lama Faki, will, will go into more detail. First, we have identified 92 people who were killed because of exposure to the nerve agent used in Khan Sheikhoun, including at least 30 children. Medical personnel there said hundreds more were injured. Second, photos and videos of the remnants of the bomb that delivered the nerve agent appear consistent with the characteristics of a Soviet-made airdropped chemical bomb specifically designed to deliver sarin. In particular, they show two remnants from the weapon used. One, a twisted, thin metal fragment with green paint, and a second, a smaller, circular metal object. Now, as for the first, green coloring is widely used on factory-produced weapons to signify that they are chemical. Specifically, the KH-AB-250, one of two Soviet-produced airdrop bombs specifically designed to deploy sarin from a warplane, has two green bands. In addition, the circular object seen in the photos of the crater appears identical to the cap covering the filling holes of the KH-AB-250, that Soviet weapon. Also, one of the first photos of the crater where that bomb landed, taken by first responders, shows what appears to be liquid on the asphalt. That, too, would be consistent with the use of a bomb containing sarin, which is in liquid form at room temperature. Now, the other elements of today's Human Rights Watch report concern Syria's broader pattern of chemical weapon use. With our report today, we show that Syria's use of chemical weapons has become systematic and widespread. Apart from the sheer frequency of use, we can now identify three different delivery systems that have been used. First, aircraft delivering nerve agents on at least four occasions. These are the ones that I just mentioned. Second, helicopters dropping chlorine pervasively. Um, Human Rights Watch in January issued a report on Syria's use of chlorine during the offensive to retake eastern Aleppo, and we were able to show that this use of chlorine was not just the isolated acts of errant commanders, but rather was a central part of the Syrian government's military strategy. And indeed, in our report, we document two more recent cases where um, Syria continued to use chlorine um, in and around Al-Latamina Al um, on April 3rd and March 25th. And indeed, in reports we've received but are not included in the report, 
we understand that just in the last two days, there have been two other cases in that same vicinity of chlorine use. So we have first aircraft delivering nerve agents, second helicopters dropped in chlorine, and third, since this past January, Human Rights Watch has documented the use of improvised ground launch launched rockets to deliver chlorine used mainly in the current battle around the Damascus suburbs. And in those cases, we have documented six separate uses in four different areas in the Damascus suburban area. So putting this together, what we have are chemical attacks that have occurred in various parts of the country, specifically in Hama, Aleppo, and Idlib provinces, as well as around Damascus. And these varied use of chemical weapons with different delivery systems in different parts of the country show that serious use of chemical weapons has become a central part of its military strategy. And of course, as so often happens with Syria's military strategy under the Assad government, these attacks are directed not only at military forces, but very often also at the civilian population and at civilian institutions. As such, these widespread and systematic attacks on civilians could constitute crimes against humanity. That is a level of culpability and horror that cries out for prosecution. If Russia and China persist in vetoing Security Council referral to the International Criminal Court, the UN should move forward expeditiously to establish the prosecutorial mechanism authorized this past December by the UN General Assembly. That is more than four long months ago. And all governments should also move quickly to provide generous funding for this essential accountability mechanism. In a moment, my colleague Akshaya Kumar will describe these and other recommendations in more detail. But first, um, I hand the microphone to my colleague Lama Faki, who played a central role in conducting this investigation and who will describe our findings in more detail. Thank you, Lama. Thank you. Can you shift the image, please? This is Ayan Ahmed Abdel Hamid and Yusuf. The twins are from Khan Sheikhoun. They are pictured here before the chemical attack in Khan Sheikhoun on April the 4th. I met their father, Abdel Hamid, a couple of weeks ago in southern Turkey, where he traveled after the tragic events of that day. Mercifully, most of us will never really understand what Abdel Hamid and his family have gone through. But it is important for us to know what happened to him and his family. Abdel Hamid shared his story with us and with countless others while he was in Turkey because he shares in that belief. The morning of April the 4th, Abdel Hamid's family, his wife and nine-month-old twins, did what so many others living in opposition-held parts of the country have learned to do when they hear the all too familiar sounds of warplanes or helicopters above. They sought shelter underground. So after 6.45 in the morning, when a warplane dropped bombs on his neighborhood, Abdel Hamid's wife, Dalal, and his kids sought shelter underground while he set out to try and rescue injured members of his extended family. And he was able to, but he did so at a cost. Abdel Hamid also became injured as a result of the chemical attack on Khan Sheikhoun, and eventually he too had to go in for medical treatment. It was only after he was treated that he learned that 25 people from his extended family did not survive including his wife, Dalal, and their kids, Aya and Ahmed. They were found dead in the shelter where they had sought safety. Because bomb shelters do not protect you from chemical weapons. They actually make you more susceptible to their deadly effects. Abdel Hamid doesn't forgive himself for leaving his family to go and care for others. What an impossible scenario that this man has had to face. 
There is no right decision in attacks like these for the people on the ground. There is no protection. His story, of course, is not unique. At least 92 people died in the chemical exposure on April the 4th in Khan Sheikhoun. We have identified that at least 30 of them are children. Hundreds of others have been injured. Each of the people from Khan Sheikhoun that we spoke with had his or her own harrowing tale of loss and of survival. Despite their individual circumstances, the witnesses consistently told us that a warplane flew over the town at approximately 6.45 a.m. on April the 4th. One resident said that he saw the plane drop a bomb near the town's central bakery in the northern neighborhood during the plane's first flyover over the town. The bomb fell on the street in front of the bakery. Several people, including this witness, said they heard no explosion, but saw smoke and dust rising from the area. This is consistent with the relatively small explosive charge in a chemical bomb. Several people also confirmed that they saw people injured or heard reports of injuries immediately after this first flyover. A few minutes later, they said, a warplane dropped three or four explosive bombs on the town. Two of the bombs fell in the northern neighborhood, where residents told us that they hit two homes in the area. We obtained information about the homes from local residents and have reviewed photographic evidence and video evidence reflecting that the homes contained regular civilian items like mattresses, rugs, and other basic furnishings. We also reviewed dozens of photos and videos provided by residents of a crater from the impact of the first bomb. Local residents believe that this was the site that was the source of the chemical exposure because those who died lived nearby and people who came near the site, including first responders, exhibited the strongest symptoms of chemical exposure. As Ken mentioned, one of the first photos of the crater taken by first responders shows what appears to be liquid on the asphalt. This is consistent with the use of a bomb containing sarin, which is liquid at room temperature. Immediately following the airstrikes, victims, witnesses, first responders, all who we spoke with, described that hundreds of people began exhibiting clinical signs and symptoms that indicate exposure to nerve agents. These include frothing of the mouth, pinpoint pupils, constricted breathing, and trembling. The French and Turkish governments and the Organization for the, Prohib <coughs> for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons have, through laboratory testing, found that sarin was the chemical used in the attack. The weapon remnants in this first crater combined with the witness observations with the victim's symptoms and the identification of sarin as the chemical used suggests that the Syrian warplane dropped a factory-made sarin bomb. And again, as Ken mentioned, according to open source material, the Hub 250, which is pictured above, and its bigger version, the Hub 500, are Soviet-produced bombs designed specifically to deliver sarin. The remnants that we have located in the crater are consistent with the use of a weapon like the Hub 250. The Russian and Syrian government's claims indicating that around 11.30 a.m. on the 4th, the Syrian government struck an ammunition depot uh, belonging to an armed group that contained chemicals and therefore causing the chemical exposure is not supported by the evidence. It is, in fact, contradicted uh, overwhelmingly by evidence, including by the time that people first began to experience the symptoms of the chemical attack. It is also inconsistent with the pattern of attacks that Ken has described. As it has been mentioned, 
evidence suggests that the Khan Shikhun attack is not the first time government warplanes have dropped nerve agents in recent months. Witnesses described to us symptoms consistent with exposure to nerve agents that they and other local residents experienced after warplanes attacked eastern Hama on December 11th and 12th. These symptoms included uh, pinpoint pupils. The December attacks were in territory controlled by the Islamic State, which of course closely monitors communication, making it difficult for us to reach witnesses. But importantly, this attack and news of the attack began to emerge within the days and the weeks following. We have since then been able to identify four witnesses who we interviewed by phone and spoken to medical personnel who treated some of the victims. One of the victims described to me how in the early morning hours he left his home in Jur, uh, fled for the outskirts of the town when he saw that there was a warplane overhead. The rest of his family sought shelter underground in their home's basement. When he returned to his home, within minutes after the warplane had dropped a bomb and had left the area, he returned to find that his family had suffocated after having been exposed to the chemical agent in the basement. They were not alone. Dozens of other residents and neighbors were similarly affected. Over 60 individuals uh, died in the attack on Jur and nearby villages. There has also been another nerve agent attack, this one in northern Hama on March the 30th. The bomb in this attack was dropped in an open field. It caused no deaths but did result in dozens of injuries of both civilians and combatants. All four of these suspected nerve agent attacks are part of the government's response to opposition offensives and ISIS offensives uh, in the areas where they took place. The nerve agent attacks that Human Rights Watch has documented in recent months are part and parcel of the systematic and widespread attacks using chemical weapons that government forces have employed since 2014. These attacks have become more widespread and systematic including since December 2016 with the Korean attacks that we have documented in Aleppo City, which the government used as part of its strategy to retake Eastern Aleppo from opposition forces. Since January, we have also documented how the government or pro-government forces have now begun to use ground-launched chemical attacks in areas around Damascus countryside. The government has received the message that these attacks will not be responded to by the international community. For the people in Khan Shekhun, in Hama countryside, in Damascus countryside, and in Aleppo, responsibility for these attacks cannot be questioned. The question for them is what is to be done about it? My colleague Akshaya will discuss in more details our recommendations, but I want to leave you with the thoughts of Abdul Karim al Yusuf, another victim of the Khan Shikhun attack whom I met. He told me, we want the international community to look at us and see our oppression, to look at us with humanity. We want to live in dignity and security and freedom. After the chemical attacks in Ghouta, in 2013, the U.S. President and the international community forced Assad to give up chemical weapons, and we thought we were no longer at risk of the government using them. And now, the U.S. bombs the runway where the planes that bomb took, took off from. But why are they going after the weapons and not those that are using the weapons? It is not the weapons who are guilty. There should be justice against those 
that used the weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Lama. We have uh, copies of our report available here in the corner. I encourage you to pick them up because in the report itself on pages, uh, beginning at page six, you can find detailed recommendations. I'm just going to highlight three main recommendations that we think would be central to an effort by the international community to act to end the permissive environment that has been created in Syria for the use of not just chlorine as a weapon, but also nerve agents. And I'll begin with what can happen here in New York with the UN Security Council. Uh, many of us were here for the recent vetoes on this file, but the fact is that both Russia and China have repeatedly used their UN Security Council vetoes to block individual sanctions and a referral of the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. Although ISIS, which has also been documented by the Joint Investigative Mechanism, has been designated by UN by the UN and uh, listed for sanctions, no one in the Syrian government has received the same treatment. So our central recommendation to the Security Council is that at this point, it's important not just for justice and accountability, but also for preventing further erosion of the norm that prohibits the use of chemical weapons, that the Security Council impose a travel ban and asset freezes on those who are within the Syrian government and part of the military chain of command who were responsible for the use on chemical attacks that both UN and OPCW investigations have already confirmed to the Council. Here, we presented new evidence today. However, the Council already has a body of evidence at its disposal in reports from the Joint Investigative Mechanism that would justify and warrant these sanctions. It simply needs to act. The second recommendation I'd like to make would be to focus on the Russian government. Both Russia and Iran are close military allies of the Syrian government, and they are in a position to influence its military decision making. This close alliance also raises the possibility that both Russian and Iranian military personnel could have been aware of the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons. This was certainly the case in the Battle of Aleppo in late 2013, where the government repeatedly used chlorine in a pattern that appeared to be coordinated with a military strategy to retake the city and as a part of a battle that both Russia and Iran participated in. And so to the Russian government, we say stop using your veto to block action at the UN Security Council. Stop abusing your veto and restrain its use, particularly in a situation like this, which involves mass atrocities, and as required by Security Council resolutions that you've already voted for, assist the UN and the OPCW in investigating the origin of the munitions that we've identified here today, which appear to be Soviet or Russian made, and that may have been used in Khan Hishehun or in any other chemical attacks in Syria. Finally, a recommendation for the OPCW, which is the organization for the prevention of the use of chemical weapons. For the OPCW, we would like that UN member states support ongoing efforts to provide them with any and all information and intelligence on chemical attacks in Syria to support their investigations. And the joint investigative mechanism itself should investigate whether any other governments, including the military allies of the Syrian government, Russia and Iran, aided and abetted in this use of chemical weapons. Finally, member states to the Chemical Weapons Convention need to stand up for what is now a blatant and serial abuse of the norm by restricting or suspending Syria's rights and privileges as a member. It's ridiculous for Syria to be able to continue to say it's a member of the Chemicals Weapons Convention in light of the kinds of abuses that have now come to light. With that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, Colin? How you know? How old is it? Um, do you have any evidence that this was in the you know Syrian stockpile? Any theories on sort of how they got it and wh whether to what degree it links Russia um, to this um, incident? Sure. So there is very limited information about the Hub uh, 250. 
Uh, what we do know is that it is a Soviet-era bomb. Uh, the Syrian government, when it acceded to the Chemical Weapons Convention, was meant to declare and destroy its chemical weapons stockpile. But that declaration is, uh, is confidential. It has not been made public. Uh, so we do, we do not have information uh, which indicates that uh, the Syrian government um, has, uh, ha does have this bomb uh, within uh, its stockpile. What we do know is that uh, some key characteristics uh, of the remnant um, appear to be consistent uh, with the remnants that were located on the site uh, of the chemical attack in Khan Sheikhoun on April the 4th. Uh, these include the cap uh, for the filling hole, as well as the uh, characteristic uh, green paint um, that is used in Soviet and also other chemical munitions. There are some important remnants which we have not been able to identify through video and photographic evidence. So for example, the tail of the weapon remnant, which would allow us to more conclusively identify this as being the weapon used. Uh, but again, you know, the, the remnants do appear to be consistent um, with this uh, type of weapon. Michelle? Uh, thanks, Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Just a follow-up from that. Do you think this might be a leftover bomb that was hidden, or do you think that maybe in the past three years they've um, manufactured some more sarin? And why do you think they've started, three years after Guta, why do you think they've started using sarin again? Yeah, and we actually we have no idea, you know, where this particular weapon came from in the immediate sense. Um, it, it obviously is a Soviet origin. We have that conclusion, really, from open source material. Um, we can't say whether you know Syria always had this and just hid it, or whether it was transferred more recently by Russia. So this is you know part of what has to be investigated. We just don't know. Um, the yeah, why? I mean, again, you know, this is getting into the realm of speculation. I mean, it's. I mean, as I mentioned in my remarks, these, I mean, I think there are two factors. One is um, the Syrian government has gotten away with using chlorine as a chemical weapon now repeatedly for many months. And there has been, you know, relatively little reaction to that. So that kind of impunity apparently encouraged um, a ratcheting up of the chemical agent used. Um, you know, second is that, you know, while chlorine can be deadly, insufficient concentration, it is much less deadly than nerve agents like sarin. And in the, um, the four cases of nerve agent use that we've identified, the Syrian military was under fairly intense military pressure on bases were being threatened by either opposition or ISIS forces. And um, the decision to ratchet up to this level seems to have been related to um, that unfavorable battlefield situation. Thank you. It's Pamela Fogg from CBS News. Uh, you have said uh, that it appears that there have been more crimes, but your report is pretty clear that it is sarin gas and that or sarin-like gas, and it is Assad, LPCW, France, UK. I mean, I, you don't need to list them. I understand it's a legal conclusion, but can you say that war crimes have been committed by Assad? And then the second piece of the question is just, you said the um, international community has not sent a message. Uh, obviously, the Security Council may not have, but has the international community, so thank you. Okay, um, let me just clarify. I mean, I think there's, there's no doubt that war crimes have been committed pervasively. What we get into here is the issue of crimes against humanity, which is you know, a, a new level of seriousness because it requires systematic and widespread attacks on the civilian population. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, follow-up, have, yeah. have crimes against humanity been committed? Um, I mean, you know, we think it's, it's likely, we don't reach the final conclusion here because it is a complicated evidentiary matter, but you know, what we feel here is we have you know, a, a pattern involving um, the centrality of chemical weapons to Syrian military doctrine and the use of chemical weapons in, in different circumstances, in different parts of the country. And so this is evidence that for us, you know, it strongly indicates that crimes against humanity have been committed. We didn't take the next step in saying they definitely have been because it is partly a question of intent and, and um, because you do, you know, you have to prove this pattern. But the evidence, you know, in our view is quite strong. Oh, thank you. 
uh, Talal Hajj from Al Arabi and Al Hadith Networks. Um, we heard you both speaking, you and Emma um, um, and, and Alicia, um, about uh, accountability. And you mentioned the General um, Assembly's resolution, which was passed on the 21st of uh, December by 105 votes. Uh, until today, um, there is no head of that mechanism being appointed or deputy in spite of we heard in a briefing that there was, but then on the record, Karin Abu Zaid uh, insisted that that's not the case. Uh, and the international community is moving very slowly in financing and making it a reality. Um, <laughs> isn't it disappointing and to see the, the world community is not moving fast enough to hold the Syrian regime accountable and what can be done to to you know, speed this process. Thank you. Um, no, we, we are, are deeply disappointed and frustrated by the failure to appoint uh, a prosecutor for this prosecutorial mechanism, which was, after all, authorized four and a half months ago. So uh, our understanding is that sufficient financing has been collected to at least appoint the head, that the ball is in the court of the Secretary General, and I hope he uses the occasion of this, this, um, you know, this disaster in Syria to move forward expeditiously. Um, but of course, that funding is really the minimal funding needed. And um, we need much more funding to conduct an investigation of, of the breadth and complexity of what is required in Syria so that you know, evidence will be collected and cases made as tribunals become um, available, whether they're national prosecutions um, and ultimate accessed by the International Criminal Court or potentially a Syrian-specific tribunal. Thank you. Evelyn Leopold, Huffington Post contributor. Um, the General Assembly procedure that's moving like a snail, they were supposed to, by the end of April, have the prosecutor appoint. Uh, is, that seems to still be the only game in town, right? There isn't any other place. And also, Russia and seems to be laying the groundwork to denounce the Jim report, regardless of what it will say. Like they're, they're um, collecting information from a remote site. They're not on the April 4th. Um, they're not in the area. They're not in the town. They're relying on NGOs and white helmets who are as everybody knows, uh, they're British spies and uh, so forth. So uh, I just wonder if you're going to look into that. Well, I mean, look at the, um, the Russians seem determined to try to poke a hole in any evidence that's put forward. But the primary cover story they presented so far is decimated by this report. Um, and you can't keep trying. It's, oh, sorry, we didn't mean that defense. Here's another one. You know, at some point, you've got to recognize that the, the Russian um, cover story is are, um, have zero credibility, and we hope that um, Russia would instead focus on stopping these chemical attacks. Um, the Assad government is utterly dependent on Russian military support by air as well as Iranian support on the ground. Um, both Tehran and Moscow have the capacity to stop these chemical attacks. The fact that they are choosing not to, that they are continuing to provide military support despite ample evidence of chemical weapon use makes them complicit in these war crimes as well. To your first point as well, there have also been prosecutions under yeah. universal jurisdiction um, laws in inside Europe. Uh, and there have also been steps uh, taken by countries to unilaterally impose targeted sanctions uh, against um, officials or entities that were responsible for chemical attacks. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, the U.S. just put out a long list of people with quite a bit of specificity. I mean, I think 250 or so individuals. So, um, I mean, that's a step in the right direction. Um, but, you know, the sad thing is that the, the universal jurisdiction prosecutions in Europe so far have of necessity been of lower level people, the people who happen to be present in Europe. And what is needed is, you know, a way to get after the commanders who are authorizing and ordering um, these apparent crimes against humanity. Um, that's why we need the, the prosecutor established, whom the S General Assembly had authorized, and that's why we need um, a higher level tribunal, something that would have access to these people. I'll take the gentleman in the front and then Edie, please. 
Thank you. Mr. Roth, um, is there anyone from Can Human Rights Watch? Can you identify yourself? Yes, I'm I.K. Kush, I'm with New African Magazine. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone from Human Rights Watch, I have two questions, anyone from Human Rights Watch on the ground in Syria right now conducting investigations or did any, was anyone there conducting these investigations you know, before you came up with your report? I mean, we have had people in and out of Syria um, repeatedly, but for this particular report, security considerations prevented us from sending somebody to Khanshikun. So this investigation was done remotely. It often involved speaking in person with eyewitnesses because those witnesses had moved. But it, we also had to use phone and other means of communication to speak with people there. But given the, the substantial number of witnesses, 60, um, as well as the consistency of those witnesses with the physical evidence and the photographs, we feel very confident in the conclusions of this report. And um, your report uh, seems to be pretty clear and, and certain about the Syrian government's involvement. Uh, in these chemical attacks. Uh, but according to Mr. Uh, Paolo Pinheiro, who's the chairman of the International Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic, mm -hmm. he said uh, a week or so ago that there, there's no evidence that the Syrian government was involved in any of these chemical attacks. Um, okay. Have you spoken with him? Have you consulted okay. with him? I've spoken to Paolo, Pergio, Paolo Sergio Pinheiro many times. I am not aware of him saying that. Or if I actually did. have him on tape saying that, well, yes. Um, then, I, then, I, then it, must be, he has, it must be because he hasn't investigated, but I actually don't think that's the case. Um, I know he has collected extensive evidence of Syrian government responsibility for numerous attacks on civilians. I'd be shocked if, he, um, if that really summed up his views of the chemical attacks. But I, I'd suggest that you go back and ask him specifically. I did. I have him on tape. Anyway, thank you. But the Commission of Inquiry, just to be clear, the Commission of Inquiry has published in its reports Syrian government responsibility for chlorine attacks, including in the context of the Aleppo operation. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just don't think that's an accurate presentation of his views. Um, hi, um, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. I have two questions. Uh, first, um, do you know what kind of nerve agent was used in any of the attack, the three attacks in Hama? Was it sarin or was it something else? And can I have a question for you on the first uh, paragraph in this release which says new evidence supports the conclusion that Syrian government forces have used nerve agents on at least four occasions in recent months. Um, you then go on to say in the body of the report suspected nerve agents and so my question is um, how do you draw this conclusion when um, y you're so definitive there and less definitive elsewhere in the report? Yeah. Well, the, um, first of all, I mean, to begin with your question, Edie, um, we don't attempt to distinguish between sarin and other variants of nerve agents because we have not done a chemical analysis. So we're aware of you know, what the French and the Turks and the OPCW have done with respect to the Khan Shikun attack. Um, we're not aware of comparable chemical analyses having been done for the other three attacks that we highlight. Um, what we can say is that based on the medical testimony, the, the symptoms of the victims, um, these symptoms are not what you would have from simply chlorine. Um, they manifest symptoms that you would have from a nerve agent. And, and so that is what leads us to conclude that this was a nerve agent. We don't go beyond that and say sarin. Um, similarly, frankly, the, um, the extent of the killing in um, particularly the, the December attacks is also indicative of a nerve agent because it would be you know, extremely unlikely for mere chlorine to have resulted in, in casualties of, of that magnitude. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Um, Aziz Rami from, for the MAP News Agency. I just have follow up for a couple of questions mm -hmm. that have been asked um, before. Um, how do you explain the fact that the Syrian government would uh, strike or, or um, conduct a chemical strike 
Um, knowing the fact that the uh, U.S. administration, especially, uh, I mean, the last U.S. administration has said that the use of chemical weapons is a red light, uh, is a red line. Um, and how would they, how do you explain the fact that they would uh, cross this red line and they know that there will be consequences? And my second question is, um, uh, what, what's your position on unilateral uh, military action, like the U.S. Uh, strike on um, uh, military, uh, Syrian military base? Do you support that? Thank you. Um, in terms of, you know, why would Syria think that it would get away with crossing the red line? Because it got away with it over and over and over again. Um, because, you know, the, the, this ultimate use of nerve agents was relatively recent, the last few months. But leading up to that, there's been extensive use of chlorine which is a chemical weapon, a pr violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, and they got away with it time and time again. And so, you know, while we're obviously not inside the Syrian government, we can't interview Assad, we don't know exactly what he's thinking, but it's fair to conclude that, you know, having gotten away with, with quite extensive use of chemical weapons, he decided to risk notching up a bit and started using nerve agents again. So, you know, that's the most I can say there, but to, to suggest that he knew that there would be consequences for crossing the red line. If anything, he knew the opposite. There had not been consequences for crossing that red line, despite him having done it repeatedly. Um, as for your question on unilateral military action, um, Human Rights Watch does not take a position on that. We have not um, advocated for or against Trump's military response to the Khan Sheikhoun attack. Not for or against Neither. We have not taken a position. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Alex Zelenin with TASS News Agency. I'm looking at the images of the bomb that mm -hmm. you provided in your report. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, I cannot find the type of the bomb you mentioned at all. And the other thing is, the one that you picture is a different sort of bomb. It's not a KHAB, it's OFAB. It's not a corrective, not an adjustable bomb. So are you sure you're correct in your? Yeah, I mean, we've, um, we've used open source material. We've checked this with experts. We're, we're quite confident that our identification of the Soviet weapon is correct. Okay, if uh, there aren't any further questions, then we'll uh, we, We've distributed extensively, including to the, the joint investigative mechanism. Um, we obviously, you know, there's a, there's a lot of follow-up work to be done. The OPCW, you know, over the weekend, as Lama mentioned, has identified, what, I think 45 cases that they're investigating of chemical weapon use. Um, we're adding this evidence to the mix and hoping that it helps in, um, in both identifying the perpetrators but also in bringing an end to this use of chemical weapons. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.